Hello. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. I'm really glad you're here. This is my second conference this year. The first one was last week. So we have quite a bit of catching up to do. My name is Manuel Meyer. I work for Trivadis, a Swiss IT service provider, so to speak. And I work as an Azure consultant. And I've been working with the cloud for many years now. And let me ask you a question. Is there anybody in the room who's never worked with Azure or did anything with Azure? Nope. Is there anybody in the room who is not totally overwhelmed by the stuff you can do with the Azure cloud? Nope. OK, that's good. Because you would either be lying or would have no idea. Because I'm still to this day overwhelmed almost every day with what's going on in this really small world of Azure, or small word of Azure. That's what I wanted to say. So what are we talking about today? I will show you my tips and tricks how not to get lost in all these services th that we can consume from Microsoft. So if you go through the agenda, the first point is when you start out with Azure at one day in your life, you decided that this is going to be interesting. I'm going to learn how Azure works, how it is, how I can use it. And that usually goes always a bit in the same direction. And that's before the big moment of overwhelming comes. Then I have the problem almost every week that I'm sold to go to a customer. The customer asks for any of the services in Azure. And my boss thinks, Oh, it's got the word Azure in it, so Manu must know what it's about. And he's an expert, because I'm not sold to anyone for thousands of Swiss francs not to be an expert. And I found a way how I can get to know new services pretty quickly. And I want to share that with you today. Then I'm going to show you the universal Azure flowchart. That's a thing that I invented in order to find out where you, you need to look, depending on what you're looking for. And the fourth and last part is the Azure Ring of Knowledge, the AROC. That's another thing I invented yesterday, um, which should give you a bit of the big picture when it comes to finding your space in the Azure universe. So let's get started. Usually, when you decide Azure is the next big thing and I want to learn it, you start with training. So you do online training or classroom training, and it's always more or less the same. The first thing you see, or one of the first, is this one, where it says Azure is divided into regions. They are distributed about over the planet. And you can deploy stuff in these data centers. There are some special data centers. But basically, the whole world is open to us now. Then the second slide is this one. There are different modes, different types of cloud computing you can do. You can move from on-premise to infrastructure as a service, to platform as a service, or to software as a service. And you can find your place on the spectrum there, depending on what you want to do yourself and what you want Microsoft to do. And then the next one is this one. It says there are a couple of building blocks in the Azure cloud that you can just consume, uh, plug together, and build solutions for cloud computing. And then the training is over. You go home. You think, oh, that's really cool. I'm going to deploy stuff in Brazil and Southeast Asia and Norway. And I'm going to build really amazing solutions. So you start, and maybe you start here, because in the earlier days, if you were looking for something, you used a phone book. And there is a phone book for Azure, which is the service catalog that lists all the stuff you can consume from the Azure cloud. So you open the service catalog, and you learned in the training, I hope so, that the services are grouped by categories. So one is AI and machine learning. One is analytics. One is compute, network, and so on. So that should give you a bit of an overview of the services. And it's maybe 20 points, so that's still easy to handle. Then we start looking at the catalog. This is the first page of AI and machine learning. And it's already like 10, 15 services that are really cool. You can do cool stuff with them. Then you scroll down and notice there's another page. So we have to clean it up a bit. There's one more page. And there's another page. And we're still on the AI part. And the scroll bar didn't move at all because the list is endless. It's so long. So we have to reorganize a bit. And then we continue with analytics. We have blockchain, compute. Compute is a big one as well. So it doesn't fit on the screen here, too. So we organize again, like this. And what do we find here? Containers, databases, developer tools, DevOps, hybrid, identity, integration, IoT, and management and governance. 
And it already goes over the screen on the right side, but we're not done yet for a long shot because we're in the middle of the catalog now. So we continue and we add all the services here. And finally, we know what we can get from the Azure Cloud. Now, my problem is my boss thinks that I'm a specialist for all of these services. And there are some I have never heard before. And I prepared the presentation yesterday, and it could very well be that it's obsolete today. Because there's stuff on the slides that's not there anymore. There is new stuff in the catalog that's not on my slides, and so on. So that's kind of a problem. And I'm thinking, Microsoft, what are you doing to us? Because 10 years ago, it was easy. You could be a specialist for Exchange Server, for SQL Server, for Windows Server, for uh, .NET Development, for example. And you had just one field, and you knew everything about it. Today, if you're a specialist for Azure, people think you know all this. And that's impossible. And it's impossible because you might have heard from science that there is a number of items the human brain can handle. Any ideas? Seven is the official number. So we see that there's a big problem between what Azure gives us and what, what we can process in our brains. So what can we do? Usually, my experience is this one. The customer shows up to my company, the company I work for, and he says, I want to know or I want to learn about virtual machines. We need a specialist for virtual machines. Then we need to speak about web applications, and we want to speak about Azure Cognitive Services. And if we have a bit of time left, we want to speak about Express Route. So I think, OK, that's no problem. I can do that. I have done all this before. Uh, let's schedule a meeting tomorrow, half a day, and I'll explain everything to you. You know what happens next? I wake up from my dream. Because that's never how it happens. It happens like this. The customer says, I heard about this new thing in the Azure Cloud. It's called Azure Resource Mover. And I'm like, Azure Resource, what? Excuse me? I have never heard this before. But of course, I cannot say that, tell that to the customer. I say, yeah, Resource Mover, done that, been there, no problem. Uh, what else? And he says, we want to speak about Project Bonsai. And I'm like, Project what? Project Bonsai? OK. And we want to speak about spatial anchors. And I, I didn't make this up. This is all in the service catalog. And it's not even in preview anymore. And I think, OK, uh, yeah, let's do the meeting uh, tomorrow at 9 in the morning. And then he says, oh, if we have time after the break, we want to hear about Azure Orbital. I'm like, what? I go to the catalog, check it out. Satellite ground station and scheduling service connected to Azure for fast down, down linking of data. There are even words I never heard before. So that's kind of a problem. What can I do now? I can go to my boss and tell him, I have no idea what he's talking about. He has to find someone else. The problem is there is no one else, because there is nobody who knows all these services who have been around for a week, maybe. So the only possibility is I have to drink some coffee, stay up at night, and dig into these services. And the way I do it is like this. I found a list of 10 pages in the internet that will give you everything you need. And I wrote a blog post about it a couple of years back, one year back. It's called How to Get to Know a New Azure Service. It's on my blog, manuelmayo.net. You will get all the slides in the end. If you pay attention now to this slide, you can even get the slides now, if you go to my blog. And I'll show you how it works. So the customer calls and says, we need an expert for Azure Application Gateway right now. And Azure Application Gateway is just a placeholder to make the example. Could be any Azure service you can imagine. So my boss it goes like, ding, 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 money, and we have a specialist, and you can buy him for hundreds and hundreds of Swiss francs. And I'm like, excuse me, but what the F is Application Gateway? How the F does it work? How much the F does it cost? How the F must I build this? How much of it do I need? Do I need the big one, the small one? And who the F on earth uses this product anyway? And the links I'm going to show will answer all these questions. So you can show up to the customer. And within the first five minutes, he thinks application gateway has been the thing of your life for the last 20 years. That's basically the goal. And I'm not trying to show off with, off with the customer, but this is just the reality of to face today. You will never find a specialist for 
each one of these services who is available, affordable, and skilled. So we all have to step up the game and get into the new stuff really fast. So how do I do it? There are two pages which should be the first thing to look at. The first one is the product page, and the second one is the documentation. These are quite obvious, I know. Then we have an FAQ page, and many people don't realize that there is a frequently asked questions page for almost all of the services. And if I hear the service for the first time, my first 10 questions will probably be in this list of the 100 questions of the FAQ. Moving on, we have Azure updates and feedback. We have a pricing page and a limits page. We have a service level agreements page, and we have samples and videos. And you can take these links and apply them to all the services you need to get involved with. So let's take a look. Product page and documentation is obvious. On the product page, it will just tell you what is the application gateway. On the documentation page, you will find out how does it work? How can I build something using the application gateway? Then we dive into the frequently asked questions for the application gateway. There are probably about 500 questions in this document. And it starts really easily. It starts with what is the application gateway? What features has, does it support? And it ends really specific. Like what, what are the supported cipher suites for encryption that are available on the application gateway? Now updates and feedback are really interesting. Azure Updates is basically the roadmap. So everything that gets pushed out into the Azure platform is on the Azure Updates page. And you can filter it. I filtered this one to Application Gateway, and it shows me two things. I can now take a look at the timeline and see what are the features that have been released over the last month, years, days. What is their state? Are they in preview? Are they in general availability? And I can find out how active is the product group. If there is nothing in the updates page, I have to be careful in recommending the product to the customer. So it tells me how did the product evolve and what are the newest features of the product. Now, if we compare this to the other one, to Azure Feedback, Azure Feedback is the page where we can place feature requests. I can say, I want the application gateway to support Minecraft servers, for example. People can upvote the feature, and the product team might or might not look at it and comment it. And the cool thing about Azure Feedback is it shows me exactly what everybody's missing who's using the application gateway. So on this side, I can see what it can do. On this side, I can see what it cannot do, what everybody's waiting for. And if you speak to a customer, the customer needs to decide if they want to use application gateway. This is really valuable information. Because the first, you can look at the first 10 points, and if they are on the list of requirements for the customer, if there is such a list, you can say, sorry, cannot use it. If you're lucky, the product team said, oh, that's an interesting suggestion, um, please tell me more, or we are looking at it, or it will be integrated in the product soon. Moving on, limits and SLAs. For every service, there is a limits page that contains the hard limits. Like in the application gateway, it's how many instances you can you have? How many backend pools can you have in one gateway? How many megabits per second or whatever can you get through the gateway? So this is also important if you need to decide if you can use the application gateway for your use case or not. And the other one is SLAs, service level agreements. They tell you how much availability do I get for this product, depending on what service tier I'm running it in, how I built it, and so on. You have to be really careful with the SLAs, because when Microsoft tells you about SLAs, it always sounds amazing. It's like if we don't give you the SLA you bought, then you will get all the money back. But that's not true, because you only get the part of the money back, depending on how much they missed the SLA. That's the first problem. And the second problem is the damage that they do if they break the system that you're running could be much, much higher than the money you get back. Then we have samples and videos, which is kind of obvious. But it's also interesting because you can filter for a product. So you can find all the samples for application gateway or all the, sam all the videos for application gateway. So this should give you a good start. And these are all the official pages from Microsoft. The 10 links I showed you are all in the documentation. But of course, there is much more. 
if I think about all the links that I know to Microsoft pages that could be interesting, maybe I could tell you right now about 30 links. If we add other stuff that's not from Microsoft, you can add another 20 on the list. If I would ask you, we would probably be at 100 of these links. So I thought, how can someone who's new to Azure handle all this information? Because it's really hard, it's just too much. And then I thought it would be great if we had some kind of flowchart where we can start at the top and we can answer questions like, what do I need to know? Do I have the service already? Or do I want to find out if I, can, can, if I should get it? Uh, and so on. And the idea behind the Universal Azure flowchart came from the Universal Engineering flowchart. I don't know if anyone is familiar with this one. It's quite simple. If you have an engineering problem, so something's broken, and you need to fix it, you can follow this flowchart, and it works for all the cases. The first question you have to ask yourself is, does it move? And if it does move, you should ask, should it move? And if it should move, that's okay, you don't have a problem. If it does move, but it shouldn't, you have to fix it using duct tape. If it doesn't move, and it shouldn't move, then you're fine. If it doesn't move and it should, you have to fix it using WD40, as we say in Switzerland. And that's also all of your problems. But maybe you're not done yet. If the problem is solved using these two tools, then you have no problem anymore. If the problem is not solved, and you try to solve it with duct tape, but it didn't work, you just have to use more duct tape. And on the other side as well, if it doesn't work with the WD40, you just have to use more. So this is the universal engineering flowchart, and I decided to create this for the Azure Cloud. And here is how it looks like. So you say, help, I'm lost. I don't know where I should go to find information. And the first distinction is, is it something I already have in Azure, or is it something I want? So if you already have it, I made these, uh, how many do we have? Seven boxes that you can ask yourself. I want to know where it is. I know I have it somewhere, but I just cannot find it anymore. Uh, I want to know how it works. I want to know how fast it is. I want to know how much it costs. I want to know how much of it I need. I want to know if it's okay, if it runs fine or I want to know if I could improve it. These are the areas that we're looking at. And on the other side, if you want something new, maybe you want to know what's on the menu. Maybe you want to know what's there in the first place. Or um, you just don't know what you should get. So these are the categories that we're looking at. And below each category, there is a couple of links that I'm going to show you. On the first one, where is it? We have the Azure portal, obviously. Then we have the Azure Preview Portal. The Preview Portal is a portal that shows you the next version of the Azure Portal. So if there are new features in the portal that are not released yet, you can enjoy them going to the Preview Portal. Then there is the Azure Resource Manager Portal. Who has worked with the Azure Resource Manager Portal before? Only a few people, OK. And there is the Azure, Azure Mobile App. Who has um, the Azure Mobile App on his or her phone? Four people? Good. So let's take a look. If you want to know how it works, you first obviously go to the documentation. You can go to the architecture center to find out how you should build the system using this component. And there's the cloud adoption framework, which we're going into a little bit later. And there is the Azure updates and the Azure feedback pages, the ones I showed you before. If you want to know how much it costs, you can use the pricing calculator. There is this total cost of ownership calculator. And there is azureprice.net, which is a really cool website. I'm going to show it to you in a second. If you want to know if it's OK, there are two pages. One is Azure status, which has all the green boxes if stuff works, and red boxes if it doesn't work. And the other one is Azure health, which is inside the Azure portal, where you can check your resources, and you will find all the service messages from Microsoft and the uh, root cause analysis reports, how they call them. If you want to know how fa fast anything is, you have, we have two websites. One is, one is azurespeed.com and the other one is azurespeedtest. We're going to look at them shortly. 
If you want to know how much you need, there are two websites as well. One is the DTU calculator. So if you're using a platform as a service database offering, you can calculate how many database throughput units you're going to need in the cloud. And there is the what the I.O. disk calculator. So if you build large virtual machines and you need a lot of throughput to the disks, um, there are a lot of tricks you can do, like having a very small solid state disks and striping them together and building a huge disk out of mini disks in order to get very high throughput numbers. And the calculator can help you with the calculations. If you want to improve stuff, there is obviously the Azure Advisor in the portal and the Security Center, which both give you recommendations for the resources you already use. If you want to know what's on the menu, there's the service catalog. We've spoken about it before. And there are two more pages that are interesting. One is the Azure Service Map, and the other one is the Azure Heat Map. I'm going to show you pictures in a second. If you don't know what you should get, there is the Solution Center and the official list of case studies related to Azure. So that's basically it. That's version one of the Universal, uh, universal Azure flowchart. And I intentionally left a bit of space because next year it's going to be full probably. So let's take a look. Um, that's a wrong slide. If you want to know where and how, I would like to show you two things, the ARM portal and the Azure mobile app. The ARM portal is a different portal than the Azure portal. It's reachable at resources.azure.com, and it shows you the truth. It's the direct view into the heart of Azure, into the resource manager. That's why it's only text. It's like an old text-based adventure game. And all the resources you have in your subscription are written out in text, and you can exactly see how the configuration looks like. The portal interprets this data and shows it to you graphically. Here you can see it on a text basis. If you need to find out what is the resource ID of my blob storage, for example, you can find it here. If you need to make a deployment where you need to reference the blob storage, for example. And you see the tabs over, over here. You can use the REST API of the resource manager to send stuff to the resource manager, to get stuff from the resource manager. There is documentation and there are scripts. If you're using Ansible, you can click the button and it will show you how to deploy this blob storage in question here using Ansible. The other one is the mobile app. Many people don't know that there is a mobile application for Azure, which basically gives you the functionality of the portal on your phone. It's available for iOS and Android. You can look at metrics, you can look at your resources. You can even run the cloud shell on your phone, which is pretty cool. If your boss thinks you're working for the customer and you're sitting on the toilet but still deploying a virtual machine, that could come in really handy. If you want to know where and how, I want to show you one thing, which is the Azure Speed Test website. That's a website somebody created, and usually with these websites that are created from the public, from the community, they tend to just disappear, and new ones tend to pop up. So it's kind of hard to keep track. But this one, I like it really much because it just looks really good. It looks like this. I'm going to show it to you live. It's this one here. And what it does, it sends a request to all the data centers to the storage account in real time, so it's moving. And you can see how, ma how much latency, end-to-end -end latency we have from my computer over my phone to Swisscom to Azure to the storage account in different data centers. And what we clearly can see is that Switzerland, luckily and obviously, is the fastest from where I'm standing. Um, then the other European ones, and there's a big latency loss once we go over the Atlantic Ocean. The other one that's mentioned on the slide deck, um, azurespeed.com, is a bit more complex. That's a page where you can run different tests. You can say, I want to upload a large file to Brazil, I want to download a small file from Japan, and so on, and find out how the latency and the speed of the system uh, turns out to be. If we want to know where and how, there's one interesting page, which is azureprice.net. Azureprice.net is another website created by someone from the community that is about pricing. And what it shows you is, you can say, I have a virtual machine running in Switzerland North, and 
depending on the type of virtual machine, how much money could I save if I moved it to another region? So if we move my, let's say I have a standard F4S machine for my web server running in Switzerland, and I moved it to central India, not sure if that's a good idea, but I could do it, I would save 20% just by moving it from one location to another. On the same page, what you can look at is VM costs per hour over all the data centers. And you would be astonished how much difference there is between data centers, even if they are closer together. If you want to know where and how, there are two cool pages. One is the Azure Service Map, and one is the Heat Map, which is called Azure Charts as well. Now, the Heat Map, uh, the Service Map is this one. It's also called the Azure Periodic Table, and it's nothing but the service catalog, just in a different layout or a different view to it. So we will have the categories on top, like compute, network, containers, and so on, and all the services on the bottom. You can click the services and get more information about the services from the periodic table. The other one is the heat map, or the website is called Azure Charts, and it looks like this. It has a whole load of functionality. This is just one part of it. And what's interesting is on the heat map, the heat map is querying Azure Update. So everything that's bright on the heat map had an update recently. Everything that's not so bright, like the stuff here at the bottom, moves down once it gets old and stale. And if you hover over one of the icons here, you will see how many updates it got in the last 30 days or the last 12 months and what kind of updates they were. So this gives you an overview, again, about how active the product teams are for certain products. If you don't know what you should get, you can go to the Azure Solution Center or the case studies. And I really like the Solution Center for one purpose. It's really useful to address non-technical people. Because all the other stuff we've spoken about so far is mostly for the tech guys. If you speak to managers or decision makers or whoever, the Solution Center is the place to go. Because if we take a look at the Solution Center, we will find the categories on the left side, the ones we already know, and we will find industries. For example, who uses one of these categories in financial services, in manufacturing, in health science. So we can dig in here and find out what people do using the Azure services. Um, this is for pharma and life sciences. We can accelerate innovation, we can protect health information, and so on. And it gives people a totally different perspective on the Azure cloud than we technical people usually have. Because we think about application gateway and network and virtual machines, and this page is dedicated to the business perspective. And you can find out who does it. Who are the big customers running stuff on Azure in the healthcare industry? And NHS from the UK is probably one of the biggest. You can look at what they are doing, what kind of tools they're using, what was the benefit for the company, and so on. OK, so let's go to the, get to the let's last part. For the Azure ring of knowledge, I tried to step out a bit and look at the whole picture. So we spoke about websites where you can find information. Um, but there's more, of course. There's training, there's the community, there's conferences, and I want to move this all into context. So the Azure Ring of Knowledge is, contains everything you basically need to know if you want to have a full understanding of the Azure Cloud. And I have to issue a warning first because I did not only create the Ring of Knowledge, I also designed it, and uh, graphic design is my passion. But I'm still a developer nerd, so please excuse the, the way how it looks. I want to focus on the stuff it means and it tells us. So the ring of knowledge looks like this. In the center of the ring, we have training. And these are the AZ trainings, which I'm going to into detail later on. And these should be the basis for everything you do with Azure. Independently of your, if you're a technical person or not, uh, there's more for you, of course, if you are a technical person, but there's something for everybody. And 
together with the trainings, you can do certifications, of course. If you work in a position where you're sold to customers, this can be really helpful. Then the second ring is what I call guidance. Now, the problem is you can go through all the trainings that Microsoft offers and understand everything they tell you. But out in the real world, you face totally different challenges. You learned in the training how, what Azure policy is, how you can apply governance, um, governance rules to an Azure cloud environment. But somehow there's a gap because now you're in the company, you have a security officer who tells you what's allowed and what not, and there's a big gap in the middle between the technical stuff and the organizational stuff. And that's where guidance comes in handy. And the guidance that Microsoft provides is the cloud adoption framework. It tells you all the thing that's not in the trainings, that's not technical, that has to do with people, with processes, with how should you proceed if the company decides to go into the cloud. You know how to build VMs, networks, app service, databases, and you know all this stuff, but somehow the big picture is still missing. That's why we have the cloud adoption framework in the second ring. Then the third ring is websites and tools. That's the stuff I spoke about for the last 30 minutes, like the Azure Tips website. I didn't mention this one, but I sh will show you in a second. And the universal, universal Azure flowchart. And the fourth ring around everything is the community, such as user groups and conferences like this one that you're attending today. So if you take a closer look, let's start with the trainings. There are four main trainings for Azure, which are the AZ trainings. AZ 900 is the fundamentals training. That's the one first one everybody should do in order to just understand the language of the cloud. Then we have the Azure administrator. That's the one you should do if you plan to work with the cloud. If you want to know how the tooling works, how to deploy stuff, how to write an ARM template and so on. It has a big focus on infrastructure as a service, but that doesn't matter because the tools are the same no matter if you do infrastructure as a service or platform as a service or anything else. Then there is the Azure developer. So if you build solutions for the cloud, if you're focusing on platform as a service, that's a training for you. And then there is the Azure architect, which is basically about draw drawing icons on the whiteboard. Um, I delivered all of these trainings, and I was really dis disappointed with this one because it somehow just didn't seem ready yet. The other ones, the first three, they have become really good. They are on point. The stuff that's covered in the trainings is the stuff you need. But with the last one, eh, maybe not so. It depends on the person who's delivering the training. And uh, there's still, still some room for improvement on the Microsoft side. So these are the basic trainings. Additionally, you can go to the artificial intelligence data platform or data analytics training and everything else that they are pumping out at the moment. So this is the core of what you should learn and know in the first ring. How can you get the trainings? The, in my opinion, best and easiest and cheapest way is to use Microsoft Learn. Microsoft Learn is the new learning plat platform where you can consume all of these trainings for free. Or you can, of course, go to a training partner and enjoy them in the classroom. Or there are two more academies. One is Pluralsight, one is A Cloud Guru, which was if I'm correct, Linux Academy first, but they removed the Linux part, not to scare off the Microsoft people. And these are all really good. Pluralsight and Cloud Guru are, you need to pay for them, of course, but they deliver really good online trainings. If you think about certifications, you might have seen these blog posts by Thomas Maurer about all the certifications where he posted study guides. So kind of what are the topics in the certification, what are the resources where you can get your information, and so on. These can help you as well. So if we go to the second ring, guidance, we want to speak about the Microsoft Cloud Adoption Framework. Microsoft realized pretty early on that there is this gap between what you have to do in the real world if you want to make a journey into the Azure Cloud and the stuff you learn in the trainings. And that's why they provided this cloud adoption framework. And it got really big. It got so big, it's almost too overwhelming as well. So the training stuff is already overwhelming. And this is overwhelming too. If you would print it out, it would be a book probably of this size. But still, it's really important. And I like to show you three things. Basically, it tells you how you should move to the cloud, considering people, tools, processes, and technology. So it begins by defining a strategy, planning phase, readiness, then the cloud adoption phase, and 
governance and management. So that's basically the larger context where you should be somewhere on this route if you decide to go into the cloud. Another part is they focus very strongly on best practices. For example, if you download this best practice guidance, you will find best practices for naming, organization of resources, identity and access, all the topics that you will find if you decide to move into the cloud that are not really covered in the training. In the training, you learn how to do it. You learn how to create resources, how to use management groups and subscriptions, how to do identity and access, but you don't know how it all works together. That's what the cloud adoption framework is for. And the third part is called Enterprise Scale Azure. If you are a larger company and you have to build this architecture with landing zones and spokes and security and everything, the cloud adoption framework will give you examples depending on the size of your company and the purpose of your cloud journey, how you should do it or how you should do it in the sense of Microsoft. So that's a really important resource you have to know on top of the technical trainings. Now, the third ring, that's the stuff we already spoke about. Um, one link to mention here is Azure Tips. Michael Crump is a guy, I think he works for Microsoft, who started collecting Azure Tips. I did the same thing, so I started about the same time he started. He's at 378 now, I'm at uh, 7. And you know why? Because 7 is all you can keep in your mind. And the other one is the universal Azure flowchart. So the tips from Michael Crump are, there are two lists. One is unsorted, which is useless because it's just tip one until 375. And this is the good one. This is the sorted one, sorted by topic. And they're all little blog posts explaining how to use a service, how to optimize this and that. And they're a really nice and big collection of tips. Moving on to the ring number four, the Azure community. One thing I'd like to show you is, since we are here in Switzerland at Experts Live Switzerland, what's going on in the Azure community. And what's going on is basically user groups. And the local heroes here in Bern, of course, is the Azure Bern user group. They have regular meetups, at the moment virtual meetups. One of the founding members is Paul, who is doing the virtual reality thing this afternoon. And if you're interested and if you're from here, which doesn't matter anymore today, actually, because you can join from all over the world, then go check them out and see what they're up to. The other one is the Azure Zurich user group. That's the one I'm organizing. And then we have Azure and AI in Basel. We have Microsoft Cognitive Services and Bot User Group Switzerland. And we have the Azure Professional Work Group. That's just the five that I know of. If any of you knows another user group that's important and related to Azure, or another website that's really cool, please let me know. But why should we stay in Switzerland? On the Meetup website, we can look at all the Azure Meetups all around the world. Because today, everything is virtual. So you can join the Meetup in Texas, in Japan, and in Brazil. We can look at cloud computing Meetups all around the world. Or we can look at Microsoft technology groups in the broader sense. So if we recap, um, I kind of tried to show you the problem when you start out with Azure, the problems I had and the problems many people have that I speak to, some of you probably had, and how I handle getting to know a new service really fast. I showed you these 10 links, which are the first links that I go through, and within a couple of hours, minutes sometimes, you get quite a good picture of the service in question. And this is really valuable, that's basically what uh, pays my salary in the end, because customers just don't find the specialists they need. It's got so complex, it's got so big. If you look for an Azure specialist, it could be someone who's working with Office 365, who knows nothing about all this. And so it's really hard. And customers have to learn that they can not call the company and will get an expert for everything they need. But they need someone who is going to explain them how it works nonetheless. So this is why you have to ramp up your game and get into this really fast. Then I showed you the universal Azure flowchart and the ring of knowledge. I'd like to thank the sponsors, of course, as well, because without them, the conference wouldn't be possible. And I'd like to thank the organizers, because it really shows their commitment to the Swiss community that they went through and doing the, company in, uh, the conference in person. 
So if you're interested in the slides, you can find them at my blog, manuelmeyer.net. Um, if you're interested in the Azure user group, feel free to check it out. We're ramping up some events by the end of the year, probably around security. Um, and that's it. I hope you enjoyed the session, learned something, and I wish you a very pleasant rest of the conference. Thank you. We still have five minutes for questions.